as grinding. <laughs> <laughs> I was working really hard to be a lot of to see my shit. Well, it's quite a bit of it. 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 Vilma has a brave snowstorm to come to your defense. I think you have to really they heard be grateful. Kelly? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all for, for coming out today, braving, braving the uh, winter weather and the end of April to, to come out. Um, thank you for making that present. Uh, so, uh, in the next hour or so, I'm going to go over some of the results that led up to and, were, and then are in uh, my thesis. Um, else, the plan is I'm going to start slow because there's some of you out there who are not particular math people, so some, give some conceptual <coughs> stuff, uh, and then uh, uh, an introduction, and then talk about some of the tools and results from, from my thesis. So that's the plan. Uh, so, but before we delve into any of the mathematics, let's start with a, a thought experiment. Okay, so suppose uh, you are taken to a darkened room. You're told to go in, the lights are all out, you can't see anything, but you're told that there's two smooth metallic sculptures sitting in there. And that you're told that you should be able to figure out if they're the same or not. Okay, so, all right, well, you walk in, it's all dark, you can't see anything, but you maybe start feeling around and you can feel these, these sculptures. And maybe the first thing you start to notice is the size of the, the sculptures. And if one has a clearly larger volume than the other one, then you can say, oh, yes, these, these guys are, are different shapes. But if they have about the same volume as you feel around, all right, well, maybe, maybe you start feeling you've got like little uh, handles like you would have on a coffee mug. And you can start counting how many handles these shapes, these two sculptures have. So again, if, if you count and they have a different number of handles, then you can say, all right, these two sculptures are different. But if they have the same number of handles, all right, well then what do you do? Well, uh, luckily, you came prepared, and uh, these are metallic sculptures. So you have a little hammer, and you go in, go to each of the sculptures, and you, you hit them, and you can, they make a sound. You can, you can listen to the, the sounds that each make. And if the two make, different sounds, like really different sounds, you reason, they'll, they, again, they're going to be different shapes because right, the same shape should make the same sound, right? But then, if that doesn't, doesn't work, well, maybe you can start doing something else, maybe a little bit more complicated. Again, you can't prepare to have like a little lasso. You can go around to all those handles that you felt earlier. You can pull uh, the lasso around a handle and you tighten it, and you can measure the length of this little, little loop on that handle. And so you can look at all of the lengths of those loops and say, all right, well, well if, if they're the same shape, they should have the same lengths of these tight lasso loops. So if they have different sets of lengths, then they are different. All right, but if that doesn't work, then All right, so, so that's sort of like the buildup to, to some of the, the questions I asked in my thesis. You might think that this is a little bit of a, uh, a ridiculous uh, uh, thought experiment, but this is actually what, what uh, mathematicians or geometers would be doing quite often because you know you, you, in your work you don't have this physical sculpture sitting in front of you right you have some description of it on a page and so you're sort of grasping at it in the darkness trying to get data from whatever you've been doing to try to determine what type of shape you have okay? um, and so this is uh, this is sort of the, the motivating uh, goal for, for this project, and so what I did uh, is to look at a higher dimensional example or analog of these la la tight lasso loops. So looking at nets, higher two, three dimensional nets, you throw into your space and tighten those and see if those are the same. So, so that's sort of the, the uh, very conceptual background for, for you guys uh, out there. All right, so let's let's now begin with with uh, some uh, background to the talk. So, start with uh, part one. 
uh, introduction. Okay. So again, just to be explicit, the big idea is to uh, construct or to find a topological or geometric data that distinguishes classes of uh, spaces, Riemannian manifolds. So those of you out there maybe want something to picture, you can think of the, maybe the types of spaces we're, we're thinking about as some, something like things like this, blobby things with holes. Um, so for example, what kind of data we're talking about? Well, all right, so the first thing, for those of you guys who, who know this, this stuff, this is like the fundamental group of your space, right, that's counting this, these handles. Um, there's volume of your space. But then we can actually make very precise this notion of the, the sound that uh, our sculpture makes. So this is what we would call the Laplace spectrum. And so this guy, this, is a set of all real numbers such that uh, lambda is an eigenvalue. Um, of the Laplace operator. Um, on L2 space. Uh, and we'll say with multiplicity. Alright. You can also look at a, a similar collection if you don't care about multiplicity. And then you can also look at um, what I'll call the uh, weak length spectrum. Which is L of M, which is the set of all real numbers, which at lambda is the length of a closed Genus. And we'll say here without multiplicity. So just to, to bring this home, that this the eigenvalues here so in some sense correspond to the frequencies that that this shape would make if it made a sound. So this somehow encapsulates that data. And this is like the the geodesics are these closed loops. So this guy here is like the lengths of our closed height glass loop. Um, so these two spectra, though, though they seem maybe a little bit different, these two are actually pretty related. Um, there's lots of relationships. I've been doing a whole paper right, about these things, sorts of things, but just as an example, there's like a, uh, um, a folk, folklore theorem that has been around. Uh, people uh, know it for a while, but I think the, the first one was written down was in uh, Rappenship's paper, which is that if M one and two are uh, compact uh, locally symmetric spaces. Uh, with non-positive curvature. Then if they have the same Laplace spectrum, so sometimes we say that they're an isospectrum. implies that they have the same weak length spectrum. Okay. So these two are actually somehow fundamentally related in a, in a lot of different ways. And so you can now start asking, you can have a question, to what extent do these spectra determine uh, the shape 
of, of your manifold. Uh, more specifically, uh, uh, do the spectrum uh, determine uh, the isometry class of M of your manifold. So unfortunately, there are some negative results. Uh, so in, in 1964, um, Milner constructed uh, tori, 16 dimensional tori that have the same spectrum but are not asymmetric. Uh, in uh, 1992, uh, sorry, 85, 80, uh, then, uh, uh, constructed uh, two two-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds. They they spell it all right. No, no. Let me check this one. I always, I always um, the last N shouldn't be there. There you go. There, thank you. You're, you're actually going the wrong way. way. Ah. <laughs> it should be over the E, not the N. I, I could accept one spelling error. <laughs> All right. Just done. Just done. <laughs> All right. All right. I had it written down. I thought I was going to get it this time. I thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been here now. I've been here. All right. So then, uh, so she, I, I don't, I don't know. How, how do you pronounce it? Do you know? Oh. I'm sorry. I'm very, I'm very sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, so, so uh, then uh, in '85, uh, Sonata produced a, a, a more general method. That constructed all sorts of examples. Okay. So. The, the problem is, all right, the, we, we can't hope that, that the spectral will determine isometry class, but what we can maybe, we'll see from this, these constructions is, well, if you look carefully, they're almost isometric in the sense that these spaces that they all construct, these kind of examples are all commensurable. So uh, we'll say two spaces, M1 and M2, are commensurable if there's a finite sheeted cover, M prime, um, so so this guy is a finite sheet cover over both, so they're commensurable. In fact, this is an equivalence relation amongst spaces. So um, uh, M, we say M1 and M2 are commensurable. And I'll denote that because this is an equivalence relation, I'll do M1 tilde little sub C. Okay. All right. So, this is an equivalence relation among spaces, and so, well, if you start, if you look, maybe, maybe not with the Laplace spectrum, but if you look at the length spectrum, you can start to see that that if you have a closed loop over here, and right, you take it up to a finite cover, right, a finite sheeted cover, it's going to still be a closed loop, and then you bring it back down, it's going to be another other closed loop where you sort of like unravel a little bit and re-ravel it. And so the, the length of this guy is maybe not the same as the length, length over here, but it's a, going to be a rational multiple of the length. So um, what you can define uh, the rational length spectrum uh, to be set of all S lambda such that S is in Q and lambda is in Q. Okay. And so we can see that, that this is sort of an invariant amongst commensurability in the commensurability class and you can now ask uh, a refined question. Uh, does uh, Q L, N, determine 
commensurability class. And so now we finally get some positive answers. <coughs> so in uh, 1992, uh, Alan Reed showed this for uh, two-dimensional arithmetic, two-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, in 2008, uh, Reed, along with some others, so uh, uh, Chinberg, uh, Hamilton, uh, Reed, so long, Reed did the same thing for three manifolds. And then in 2009, this result of uh, Prasad Rapachuk has a, a wide, uh, a wide uh, collection of spaces that this covers. Prasad and Rapachuk. Um, so, so that for any, uh, so if M1, M2 uh, come from uh, simple, R groups, so simple uh, Lie groups, not of type uh, A N uh, D uh, two N plus one or E six for N greater than one, then. Uh, then this is true. If they're length if they have the same rational length spectrum, then they're commensurable. However, for each of these, is it good enough for one of them to be like this? I'm, I'm, if, do both of them have to be um, not from this type, or is it good enough to just have one not from this type? Um, so, so the, the the conditions on the length spectrum actually forces them to be of the same type. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, except for the case, except for this case would be and C it. But um, okay. So, however, when you're not in one of these cases, there are counterexamples. So, uh, however, counterexamples for. Uh, these these types a n d two n plus one and d six. So in particular, these collections of spaces include uh, uh, arithmetic, uh, hyperbolic, and manifolds. So this these guys include arithmetic, hyperbolic, name that comes from from these guys arithmetic. Hyperbolic and manifolds where n is congruent to one with four. So these spaces are of some interest, so we want to maybe start looking at uh, maybe some additional uh, data that can actually separate these commensurability classes apart that we can't with these uh, with the length spectrum. Does um, a Laplace spectrum distinguish both? I'm sorry, what? Does a Laplace spectrum distinguish both? So when these guys are compact, it should say like the same stuff. I don't know about the, yeah, the, yeah I don't know about the, yeah. I mean, is there any hope that things like this are true without the word arithmetic, or is that just, I mean, I know the techniques are very, very heavily arithmetic, Yeah. So is there an expectation of the I'm not sure. I mean, if, if one is arithmetic, then the other one is going to, if in their length principle, then the other has to be arithmetic. But I don't know if, if they're just, and then the same stuff applies. Right. 
Right. Well, most hyperbolic two manifolds are not arithmetic, for instance. So, I mean, is, what, what is, do you know what one expects? Even? Is there an expectation? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. sure. Okay. I'm yes. Yeah. It's a good question. Well, there's zero ideas on proving these. I said, without the order. No one knows the same the right. <laughs> 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 so you reduce it to algebra, you solve the algebra problem, and you can only bring it back to the Yeah. All right. So we have positive results, but there's some uh, constraints here. So, so it doesn't show us everything. Just like it, it, it's provably not able to tell us certain things apart. So we want to look for something else. And so the idea is to maybe look at um, higher dimensional analog of geodesic, so these closed close, uh, lasso loops. So look at totally geodesic submanifolds. So to, uh, um, then to make this precise, well let's define uh, two uh, two sets, so TG uh, M to be isometry classes. Of totally geodesic, oh, I should say, of uh, non-flat finite volume. Submanifolds. So the word not flat just means effectively I don't want to look at geodesics. In some, you know, in some sense I just want a separate uh, collection of data. Um, so and then finite volume is the analog of being closed in some sense. Right? I don't want the, the big the big ones, just the final volume ones. Um, and then also define uh, Q, T, G, M to be uh, the commensurability classes. Classes of elements in T, G, M. So this is sort of analogous to the, to the uh, rational length spectrum. Uh, because these guys, right, we just, we don't care about, right, the, if we, we only care about, you know, the optical commensurability class, so it's sort of the anal analogous uh, constraint. Um, and there's some hope that these things should tell you something about your spaces. Uh, so, so uh, Ben with uh, 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 Alan Reed proved the result that if you have hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, if they have the same set of polygenistic submanifolds, then, well, either the set is empty, happen or or then they're commensurable so th there's some hope that that and, and they they showed it for effectively this guy or something we could write for the, the homotopy class and the type of space but um, but so there's some hope that maybe these guys can tell apart these these uh, classes um, and so so I looked at this in my thesis and this brings me to this uh, to the, the theorem that uh, that was sitting on the board. So this is like the, one of the main theorems of, of my thesis, that so if you have two arithmetic locally symmetric spaces uh, coming from quadratic forms uh, of dimension greater than or equal to five, then if they have the same, and I call that the totally geodesic commensurability spectrum, uh, they have the same uh, totally geodesic commensurability spectrum, then they are commensurable spaces. Um, so that's the statement of the theorem. Um, and then the next half hour is going to be spent going over sort of the, the arguments behind this, this theorem. Um, and so the sort of the idea. Which, which groups does this correspond to? Uh, groups of type BN and some groups of type D, if you would. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the idea is to prove, prove the contrapositive. So that's the mindset they're going to be in. So that means I'm going to look 
at two spaces which are not, uh, that are not commensurable. I'm going to want to show that they have different uh, sets of total genus and submanifolds up to commensurability. So I'm going to take my two spaces here. So this is sort of our, our journey in the next half hour. We're going to take two spaces here that are, are not commensurable. I'm going to translate this into groups. So this is going to correspond to different groups. This is going to then correspond to different quadratic forms using uh, information about quadratic forms. I'm going to construct certain subforms of the quadratic forms, which will give us certain subgroups, which will give us certain um, total geodesic submanifolds uh, that that you know, they weren't commensurable. That it's in one but not. So that's the plan. And, um, can, I, can I ask? Yes. About EGM, you say non-flat. Yes. Do you allow things like circle cross manifold, which is not flat? Right, so so it can be in there. Like it, it doesn't have to be in there, but right now the set includes that. All right, so section two. Um, arithmetic spaces uh, and. Uh, so, um, I'm going to start talking over here. What what are arithmetic locally symmetric spaces in particular, just of this type? Um, so, uh, and just to make things a little bit simple, because people are interested in the uh, hyperbolic case, I'm just going to say things for the hyperbolic. Uh, spaces, but the, the description is totally generalized. Here. So, um, and arithmetic uh, hyperbolic space coming from a quadratic form. Is, so that's so the whole space um, is we look at the this big group mod S O N, so this is gonna be our hyperbolic space, and then we've got these folding instructions. So those of you guys who are not math people, that we're we're going to have some big sheet and we're gonna fold it up with some arithmetic uh, uh, blue, you know, folding instructions here. So so where, where uh, this this uh, gamma is arithmetic in the following sense. So first of all, I'm going to let K be a totally real real uh, number field. Uh, so you can think of Q, or maybe Q adjoining the square root of 2, and not something like Q adjoining uh, I square root of A minus 1. Okay? Um, and let's just say that, so it's totally real, so it, it, it goes into the real numbers. It has some embeddings. So let's just label those. So V1, uh, let's do VL, uh, real embeddings. And then we take some quadratic space over uh, K. So it's a quadratic form, so you can think of it's symmetric bilinear form is sort of associated to this guy. Um, and such that uh, when you embed this guy into the real numbers, you get a real vector space. So with respect to the first embedding, so I'll just denote it like this, uh, Q um, of V1 uh, has 
signature and comma one. And for all the others, the I uh, has signature uh, and plus one. So, so those of you guys who are familiar with this, the uh, Sylvester's law of inertia, that all that, that sort of determines a quadratic form over real numbers is the dimension and, and the signatures, so the number of positive and negative uh, eigenvalues. Um, okay, so we then, from here, uh, we get we get a group of isometries of this quadratic form. So S of Q. So this guy, we can say this is the set of all uh, elements in SLN plus one of K. So this is N plus one by N plus one dimensional matrices of determined one uh, with, with values in this uh, number field uh, such that it preserves the quadratic form for all for all the so this particular group is going to sit inside of well inside of each one of these sort of corresponding real Lie groups so it's going to sit inside of well, it's going to sit inside of S O N comma one the isometries of this this guy but it's also going to sit inside the asymmetries of each one of these so it's going to sit inside a product. L S L. So it sits inside here. Um, but also inside of this guy, we have the set of matrices that have like integer coefficients. So inside of here, we also have uh, lambda, which is going to be defined to be uh, S O Q, intersect the, the guys with the integer points. Uh, S L N plus one. Okay. And lastly, well, well, this this is going to be some non-compact Lie group across some compact guys, so so we can just project onto the first coordinate. So this we have a map of this guy to here. So number theory tells us that that this guy sitting inside of here is always going to be discrete. It is going to be a, a lattice. And so when we project out to up to the dot compact factor, it's also going to be uh, a lattice. Okay. So um, with, with that in mind, we're going to then define any gamma inside of, of S, O, and 1 which is commensurable uh, to uh, the projection. So if we call the projection uh, pi, if it's commensurable to pi of lambda, uh, is it OK? And what it, what it means to be commensurable for two groups, it just means that if you're sitting inside a big group, then their intersection in that group is finite index in both of those subgroups. Sub okay. So with this construction, right, we get the things that we call arithmetic locally symmetric spaces coming from quadratic forms. And um, uh, we'll have, let's have a, a few remarks about these. So remark, um, remark one is all even dimensional hyper, arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds come this way, come from this construction. So all even dimensional and uh, half, in some sense, half of the half of odd dimensional. Uh, arithmetic. Box spaces all come from this way. So this result in particular when you talk about the even dimensional spaces, you could just drop 
the words coming from quadratic forms and covers them all. Some of the others come from these skewed Hermitian forms over uh, quaternion division algebras over number fields. So, so, all right. So that's the that's this guy. So the second re remark I want to make is that um, if you have a subform of your initial uh, quadratic uh, quadratic form, if you have a subform, then this gives you a subgroup of subgroup of isometries. And this, this sub, uh, subgroup will then can give rise to, uh, well, it will give rise to a sub, uh, a telegeodesic subspace. So a subform here gives you a subgroup here, which gives you a subspace here. And if you make sure that it does, at the, these real places that the, the things are isotropic, then you can make sure that you have trivial space, but even if it is, it's Okay, um, great. So the last remark I want to make, or it is a theorem, uh, so the corresponding spaces M1 and M2 are commensurable if and only if the groups that they come from S O Q1 is isomorphic to SO Q2 as these algebraic groups. So the problem of sort of understanding commensurability comes over over to studying these groups. Okay. So moving on then. Uh, we want to, right, so we've moved it all the way over here. So now we want to understand, really understand uh, quadratic forms uh, over number fields. So section three, quadratic over number field, over local and global. So, uh, for us, in characteristic zero, a local field um, is going to either be C, R, so the complex numbers, the real numbers, or uh, some finite extension of the chaotic numbers. Okay. And our, our number field, has lots of embeddings. Uh, so, well, <coughs> specifically completions with respect to uh, some, some, uh, some norm has many embeddings in, into these local fields. So I'll denote that set. So when you have an embedding of the number field, you also get sort of a, just like we had over here, we get a number uh, from the quadratic space over K, we get a quadratic space over a local field. And so a quadratic space over local field, well, there's lots to say about these guys. So our plan is to sort of take our, our quadratic space over number field, look at the quadratic spaces over all these local fields, and then say something there, maybe hopefully bring it back. So, uh, uh, just a, a remark, the quadratic spaces over C are totally determined by its dimension. Over R, I already mentioned it's determined by dimension in the signature, the Sylvester's law of inertia. But over, over the uh, finite extensions of the chaotics, it's a little bit trickier. So um, uh, we may assign uh, uh, to a quadratic form Over, over L, so that will denote the, the finite extension of the, uh, the addicts. Well, we can 
do, of course, the dimension, which is some, some number of you know, positive, uh, positive integers. You can associate to it its de uh, determinant, which is some number, which is not a zero number, but right, we, we only care about these things up to isometry. And so if you're thinking about the, these quadratic forms as some symmetric bilinear form, right, when you look at, at, at these forms, right, if you look at an iso isometric form, you have to do a you know, transpose of a ma matrix in, in a matrix itself, right, with this multi matrix multiplication. But if you look at the determinant, you just multiply by some square. So this, this determinant for a quadratic form is up to isometry, only will define up to square class. So it's here. So that's only it's well defined up to square class of our of our field. But lastly, there's the Hasse Minkowski variant. So it's some number C, which is takes on values plus or minus one. So mysterious, it comes from number theoretic stuff, uh, some product of Hilbert symbols. Uh, and it, it behaves has certain product formulas, which we'll, well, we'll show you in just a moment. But these guys are right, assigned to each of your forms, and it turns out that these totally determine your quadratic form. So, uh, uniqueness. If you're over your, still your local field, so if you have Q1 being isometric to Q2, this is the same thing. So if and only if uh, the dimension of Q1 equals the dimension of Q2, the determinant of Q1 equals the determinant of Q2, and C of Q1. So it's totally determined by these, these three values. And second of all, there's an existence result. <coughs> which says that for any uh, n, uh, d, and c in this collection of numbers. So, So given any triplet, any triple, uh, there exists a form with these invariants, except a couple of notable exceptions. C has to equal one when uh, the dimension is equal to one, or when the dimension is equal to 2, and the determinant is equal to minus 1. And so it might seem as though this is sort of like oh, a couple minor exceptions and small dimensions. This is actually going to prove to be pivotal in the, so the arguments that uh, I wind up making. All right, so we un the point is we understand these forms in terms of these invariants. And, um, I actually spend a bit of time in my thesis relating these, these invariants to the isomorphism classes of, of these local groups. So there's, there's a, you know, a bit of dictionary of what the, when the forms tell you, what the forms tell you about the isomorphism class of the groups. Um, a naive question. How big is this L star mod L star squared? So this, like, like, typically, it's like four things. What? It's a group of four L ones. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, with the exception of uh, the dyadic places, so like the you know, the, the two addicts, oh. then you have have eight, yes. eight. You have more. Yeah, uh, but other than the, the, the for the two addicts, okay, for these little these finite situations. Just... <coughs> All right. So now we have all of these invariants. We can study. Can study these things, construct these existence results, we can 
construct these forms locally. Uh, we can construct certain subforms, uh, but we need to make sure that if we construct subforms locally, we can then get some global thing. And so there's there's a, a global result that I'll just mention. Um, uh, Dimmon uh, family of quadratic forms, one for each one of these embeddings, uh, which are compatible. So they have to have the same dimensions, and determinant, and, and the Hasse Minkowski things, the variants have to work out well, yeah? They have two different embeddings that are the same DK. So we're only looking up to to uh, you know, up to equivalence of embeddings. So up to that, it's okay. It's unique. Yeah. Okay. Um. um right. So s given a family which are compatible, uh, there exists a uh, form over. So, so the point is, is we can can work with stuff locally. We have all these invariants. We can piece them all together into a global form. So that's that's allows us to construct subforms of the right type. Okay. So we've sort of got it over here. Now we're going to start the journey back to get our totally geodesic uh, subspaces. So, so I, I, I'm completely confused. So you have. Um, lots of embeddings. Mm -hmm. By lots, you mean one. So, so it's it's one for for each equivalent, you know, completion with respect. To, so you look at all the equivalence classes of these norms. Okay, so you have countably many of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can prescribe that every countably many such thing what you get, and then you get different things. Uh huh. And so you just you just constrained by what compatible means. So, right. so you know, same dimension, same determinant, and yet. Uh, there can only be a finite even number of, of uh, minus ones here. Otherwise, they'll have to be minus one. All right, so section four, instructions. So the big idea here is uh, I'm going to exploit these, these uh, these restrictions. So exploit restrictions uh, to obtain non-existence results. So there's a whole chapter in my thesis dedicated to these sorts of constructions. Uh, of various types, but I'll just give you sort of a, a toy theorem uh, that sort of encapsulates the sort of arguments that, that are there. Um, so suppose, so let, we're going to look at three forms. So R is going to be uh, 1, 1, 1, minus 5. Uh, phi 1 is going to be 1, 1, 3, 3, uh, minus 5. And phi two is going to be one, 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 three, three minus one. So I've got these three forms, so they're over over q. So the first thing I'm going to say is that R is not a subform of phi one or phi two. So this is this is a four-dimensional form, five-dimensional form, and six-dimensional form. So this four-dimensional form cannot be a subform isometric to any subform, <coughs> this four dimensional form or this five dimensional, sorry, five or six dimensional form. But even stronger than that, R, the isometry group of R is not a subgroup of the isometry groups of either of these two guys, S O V1 or S O V2. So this is stronger because there are non isometric forms that give the same isometry group. So not only Right? There, it could be that there's a non-isometric guy in here that has the same isometry group, so the isometry group could still sit in there. But it turns out that, that this, for this particular guy, the group itself cannot sit. So I'll, I'll explain how this is the, 
how you can see this. So the proof, start with one. So, okay, so suppose, suppose it is a subform. It is, so, so suppose there exists T such that, uh, so one dimensional form T such that T plus R is isomorphic to phi one. Okay, so then we're going to look look at a local place. We're going to look at the the three atoms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's not the two atoms. <laughs> not it's not the two atoms. They're no yeah. Stay away from those. <laughs> so you look at the three atoms. Um, so at the three atoms, right? We we can totally. I mean, you look at the invariance for t, right? So let's just make sure we know what the invariance for t are. So, so it's the dimension of t has got to be one. The determinant of t, well, it's going to have to be one as well. And the, by this restriction, no matter what, it's got to have Hasse-Minkowski invariant equal to one. Okay. So with these things in mind, we're going to just check the computation for the c Hasse-Minkowski invariant for for phi one. So there's a, a product formula. Just trust me on this. So if you have have a form which is a product, if a form that's a product like this, then you can compute the Hasse-Minkowski invariant as follows. So, so it's at, at the three addicts. So a little three there to remind you. So it's the Hasse-Minkowski invariant of T, the Hasse-Minkowski invariant of R, and then there's this extra factor coming from the determinants of these things, but the determinant of the first one is one, and the determinant of the, the second one is minus five, which is three atoms is also one. Don't worry about this. This thing is just going to be one. It's a Hilbert symbol for those of you guys who know. So this is one, one, and one. Just check that this, these things have to be. Everything's one. Okay. So, all right, this is one. But if you go back to the original definition of this, this form, right, so I have the three atoms minus five is a square. So if this thing boils down to the, the Hilbert symbol for three, three, which is the three atoms is minus one. So, but uh, C3 of phi 1 is equal to minus 1. So that's the contradiction. So it cannot sit as a subform. And so you're, you can take this as your homework. Uh, you can do the exact same computation for this guy. It's the exact same thing, only you're exploiting now the two dimensional restriction as opposed to the one dimensional. You're not allowed to give homework after the end. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. It's reading period. <laughs> you can't have an exam with only this reading period. Right. I am already signed up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll take that back. I'll, 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 I'll do it in office. I'll, so, okay. So, um, so just a sketch for two. So two is actually a little bit more complicated because it really does require like. The, the relationship between the in, these invariants and the isomorphism classes of the forms. But just to, to sort of say what's going on here is that, that R is the split, gives you the split group of type D2. Um, and so any other form that gives you the same group is also going to have to give you a split form of D2. But the split group, I mean, that this is going to determine the invariants. It's going to have, it's actually going to determine, determine both the, I mean, it's going to determine all of the invariants for this guy. And so it's it totally determines this computation. So you get the same computation no matter what other form you pick. So that's sort of the so it's just write it down it's more work, but those are the words that make it work. And so I, the the point is is that that I you uh, so corollary. So this group S O R um, plus just one on it is not going to be isometric, isomorphic to S O P one. It is not isomorphic. And inside of this guy you have your this guy is by construction a subgroup here, and it's not a subgroup here. Alright. So these non-isomorphic forms you can tell apart right there. There's a subgroup in here, not a subgroup. So um, but more generally so remark Whenever, so this might have seemed specific, but this, like I said, this sort of encapsulated the whole uh, sort of arguments that, that I make. Uh, so that whenever you have uh, SOQ1 not isomorphic to SOQ2, 
So whenever they're not isomorphic, there's always going to be. So there exists R uh, such that SOR is going to be in one, up to reordering, uh, is going to be in one and not the other. And so, and so as a consequence, right, whenever you have two spaces, put it up, up here, whenever you have two spaces that are not commensurable, there exists an N such that uh, up to commensurability, it's a total genus submanifold here, but not here. And so this, 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 these are the big ideas behind the proof, right? Came from quadratic forms, back to groups, back to the, the spaces. Um, and just a couple, so that's the, the big idea, yes? And so your proof suggests that these things are going to have, are going to have four dimension one or two? So in the hyperbolic set, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. And so, uh, if you did a more general construction, they have higher co-dimension depending on the various impacts. Um, Was that the rank of like, the real rank or the real rank? So, uh, the co-dimension. So it's, so, it's complicated because there's that big product formula, right? And so each place it. Oh, maybe. So it's, it's, it depends on the, all the oh, different places. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so just a couple. Right, con concluding remarks. So, section section five, conclusions. Um, so the uh, so this construction for works right for, for these even dimensional forms. For even dimensional forms, it turns out you only need to go to co-dimension one things for the arithmetic hyperbolic stuff. So you only have to go down one. But for some of these odd dimensional spaces, sometimes you need bump it down by two. Um, so there's also an interesting, this, this particular example. Can you explain this? What does that have to do with the non-existence of yeah, the so, other guys? Yeah, so when in, in certain situations, like, like maybe for this one, for this six-dimensional form, this gives you a five-dimensional hyperbolic space, the, the four-dimensional things are, are uh, going to look the same. Within it. You're just not going to be able to, to tell them apart, at least from these methods. But you can tell them apart from this, this co dimension 2 thing. And so this particular example is interesting because this, this gives you an example. So from some extra work, I can just say that this is going to give you an example of a five dimensional hyperbolic manifold and a three dimensional hyperbolic manifold such that this, these, these have the exact same surfaces. The exact same surfaces, but this guy is not a sub, does not sit inside of here. So interesting. I'll, and also, um, should remark that that um, right, if you have the same totally geodesic, same totally, totally geodesic commensurability spectrum, then you're commensurable. But if you're commensurable, you have the same length spectrum. So up to rational multiples, uh, totally geodesic manifolds determine the lengths of all your geodesics. But there are totally geodesics that don't lie in any totally geodesic submanifold. There's some that sort of go all over the place. So somehow, even though that they're not they're not sitting inside of a totally geodesic submanifold, this picks out the lengths. Can you say it again? Um, the, the last the half sentence. So there exists geodesics that don't live in, okay. in a, in a sure. totally cool. geodesic submanifold. Uh, but nevertheless, they're, the lengths are determined up to fresh multiple are determined by the sets of total geodesics. I mean, there are only finally many total geodesics of many folds, which are not geodesics here. Is that right? But, I mean, that should be a lot, given all of the subforms. I mean, this is, this is true you for... You have tons of subforms. Yeah. yeah. So you have countably many of those subforms. I, I do not know the cardinality. Okay. It's Kevin. It's Kevin. Okay. Does the invariance are They're parameterized by integers. There's infinitely many commensurability classes, and each one of those commensurability classes produces infinitely many immersed primitive submanifolds. There's a shit up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Just a crap. laughs>
So, so yeah, so that's so that's it for these results, and you know, there's more room to 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 go in this question. So, you know, like, like I said, there's a couple type, groups of type dn that are not determined by quadratic forms; they're determined by these skew Hermitian forms. So that's one, you know, thing. so going in there and fixing those guys up, uh, and then applying this to some of these other groups. So anyway, so that's so that's it. So thank you guys all for coming out, um, and yeah, I. Yeah, that, that's it. That's good. All right, so I, I will go. Yeah. Who else? Is, are, are there any questions from the general audience? I'm going to ask a question. What about n equals 4? Yeah, so n equals 4 is, uh, is, is tricky because there's these groups. Uh, right. So, so in general, if you just said four, right, these groups are going to be hard to to tell apart. One, three, uh, because at the real places there's trouble. But if you insist that they're they have the same um, the, the exact same signature at the real places, then sometimes uh, can get them to work out correctly at the finite places. So that's sort of a more conditional result at four. So they're both real hyperbolic numbers, no problem. Uh, so, so there's there's still some some issues at some finite places. So uh, the, like, uh, right. So so there's this issue that if, if the uh, for odd dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, sometimes you have to go down by two, and sometimes you can just go down by one. So in the situations where you could go down by one. You know, the, then this, this method should work fine. But if you have to go down by two, then there's going to be some issue because these, there's two 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 dimensional forms, and there's like these, this restriction for two dimensional forms. So it's going to like you might have some non-existence issues there. But in this case, is this a pinch of a pinch of our other results tell you? So yeah. So so for for uh, yeah, they if they're like spectrum, if they have the same like spectrum, spectrum. Like, yeah. Oh, so, so yeah, so right, but in yeah, it's it's fine. Yeah, I'm just saying, my methods won't work. But 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 Ben's result that I mentioned, if they if they have if they have surfaces, subsurfaces, then then they work. Right. Yeah. 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 So what what do you do when there's nothing? There's nothing. There's nothing. I mean, probably don't think about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not. No, but I mean, is it a situation that you can use length spectrum in those cases? Uh, I mean, the length spectrum stuff was you know, already sort of used, right? I mean, uh, you know, Chinberg, Hamilton, Long, Reed, you know, investigate at least uh, for arithmetic hyperbolic that the length spectrum. Yeah, in dimension three. In dimension three. So in, in higher dimensions, of course, you don't have any submanifolds. Uh, in higher dimensions, the arithmetic ones always do have lots of submanifolds. Dimension three is just a little weird. It's I mean, S O S O three one is just not, you know, not typical. Not, not having not having to leave this. But I thought there are some. We like more it's more interesting. No, it, <laughs> in dimension seven, it, no, in dimension seven, those things, even the weird ones, still have <laughs> submanifolds. So there's still these services. But. Don't make us put Jordan Elsberg on the board. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, if there aren't any more general questions, then we should. I have a general. We should. We should free the audience. So, is this <laughs> known to? Is this known or known to fail for other types, like for AN? Or? Yeah. So. So I mean, they, they already feel like we, they're they're things that are not commensurable that have no tautologistic things, right? So well, I mean, but, yeah. So I I don't actually know of examples. So so I mean, where if you have this paper, right? I, yeah. I mean, they have a, I mean, they're not commensurable, and they have a lot of common submanifolds, but it's a little difficult. It's a little difficult. I mean, probably I don't know how to do it for all submanifolds. So. Like, could you use the 
Lubatsky, Samuel's Vishnay stuff for SLD in order you know, to get those those sorts of things just don't contain any sub manifolds. Uh, really? Yeah. For any day. Like and you might be able to do this, you know. I mean, certainly if the algebra is prime degree, then you're not going to have any. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you can find some uh, sub algebras, but I don't, you know.